Well, I'm starting up the broadcast a tad bit earlier here. We'll go up here. We'll let it sink in. RJ's Evolution Hour. So that everyone can clearly see who it is is looming over the seats of empty seats. Okay. I uh, hope to have a kind of fun one today that's relating to subject matters that, um, or in a variety of ways, but uh, need to dive into again. And that is source methods and how you apply it in the science area. Uh, but it also applies to history and politics and everything because it is the universal toolkit. I'll be looking over here since I'm the only one in the room. Uh, I'll be looking over periodically to our live chat to see what's going on in there. Uh, I see Lord Quackle Squirrel and I uh, got Fino and the first guy. There we go. Um, there are three levels of scholarship that relate to how you approach any subject matter. And the first one is, are they relying on secondary sources rather than primary sources? Secondary sources are pretty straightforward. They're citing a book that they've read or maybe a video or a YouTube page or it doesn't matter. Um, it can be a perfectly accurate secondary source. The mere fact that something is a secondary source doesn't mean that it's a problem. Uh, but it could be an indication that you're dealing with a parasitical scholar on secondary sources is always uh, a potential giveaway of a problem if you start probing what sources they're relying on and how they're going about constructing it. Um, the next level relates to um, how they deal with primary sources. Uh, you can cite primary sources up the yin-yang. Does that mean you are fairly representing them? Ah, that's where we get into a fun subject, which I dubbed in the uh, description of the thing, the Dracula rule. It pops up a bit in hashtag uh, tip, the old uh, Troubles in Paradise work, um, and uh, is a tool that is not as often used as it ought to be, although I bet when I describe what it is, everybody has bumped into it at some time or another and have enjoyed employing it. Uh, if somebody is unaware of a source, say Schmidlap on whatever subject, and they've never cited it, they don't know anything about it, they've never heard of it, you can accuse them of ignorance because they don't know about the famous Schmidlap work. The moment they cite the Schmidlap work, though, uh, we invoke the Dracula rule. Uh, in the old Bram Stoker Dracula, you can't, uh, he couldn't come into your house unless you invite him in. But if you invite him in, he can come in any old time he wants, and he doesn't have to have your permission to do so. The moment you cite a technical source, uh, or a book or work of any type directly, everything in it is fair game. Maybe they never read the original work. That doesn't matter. They cited it. And uh, so various uh, cases, I see Jackson uh, uh, Wheat's in there uh, in the uh, side room. Uh, he knows firsthand about the matter of what it means to do a primary source uh, analysis uh, because he and I ch chatted with him about uh, uh, Dinesh D'Souza recently. That wasn't an evolution subject. It was in relation to uh, his diatribes on Margaret Sanger and eugenics and the like. But it was, again, a matter of where somebody cites a primary source Maybe they've read it good, maybe they don't. Now those two things, the primary and the secondary source issues, are all the material that somebody cites themselves in furtherance of their argument. You should always be kind of suspicious of somebody who's making sweeping claims, but they're only citing secondary sources, and you need to be even more suspicious of somebody if they cite a primary source and are misrepresenting its work. That involves you having to read the secondary, the primary and the secondary works yourself. It gets more fun and more complicated when you realize there's a third layer to scholarship, and that is what's getting left out. Um, if some every ideologue and numbskull that's ever come down the pike, flat earthers and geocentrists and Holocaust deniers and everybody but Shakespeare wrote Shakespeare's plays, all of these people at one time or another are going to be offering tons of evidence. They're going to have source citations. Dinesh D'Souza is chock a black with it. Creationists are. The problem is what they leave out. Now, they may be leaving it out honestly because they never read far enough to know that they're leaving it out. All they've done is copy parasitically somebody else's argument. And that'll probably show up 
in the source level because you're going to see how they're basically repeating material they've seen from other people. They're not coming up with original research. They're using dated material. All of that's going to start being really obvious when you look in that. But the only way you can find out what they've left out is if you've read the stuff they've left out. So that means uh, that to become a really serious player in any discipline, whether it's science or history or in the political realm, you've got to be able to read beyond the box. You have to read beyond the ideology. You have to read beyond just your comfort zone. Uh, so um, as a smug, arrogant bastard that I am, the reason why I can be so nasty uh, with creationists is because I've read more of their stuff than they have. So I actually have a, a, a broad data set. Plus, I've read the material they haven't and so can measure most precisely just what they're leaving out and what they're not. Um, that third zone is often the killer area. Uh, Jackson is one of those reading my book, uh, Evolution Slam Dunk, and he'll be seeing about how the stuff that isn't mentioned by anti-evolutionists regarding the reptile mammal transition is often the place where they're really falling apart. Not directly their source citations, although there are tons of examples of misrepresentations and muddle there, but it's the stuff they don't even realize that they don't know. The ones that are so far behind the data curve, they don't know they're behind a curve. They think they're on a straightaway and everybody else is way down past them uh, in the actual data department. So those three areas are the zones you have to move back and forth on. And that means when I'm looking at a book argument, the first place I'm looking is not at the content directly, but at the source base. Uh, is it referenced? Uh, do they have footnotes? Do they have a bibliography? And I pour around in a lot of that and check their index on certain topics if they've got an index uh, long before I actually start investigating their main argument up front to get a feel for how much they're dependent on secondary sources and if so what types how much they are actually referring to primary sources and if I'm familiar with them and if harder to find out whether or not there's stuff I'm aware of that isn't showing up on their scope and so that's the omission part um, that only comes from experience and it also means that in the process of investigating each one of those levels, you're going to know way more about the subject than you would have before if you just came at it from a philosophical level, whether you're talking about politics or science or uh, history or anything. Uh, oh, Christina Blackfeather, hello. I see she's in the room. Um, I put up links for, uh, for um, uh, in a variety of venues on Twitter for anybody that wanted to join the hangout here who does uh, and who has a link to it feel free because as much as I love hearing myself talk I also uh, enjoy even more having a direct conversation with people to where we can exchange ideas back and forth so I will jump back up here and take a look at what's going on in the live feed Jackson brings up um, the dino arc size proto avis Jesus birth dates yeah those are all instances of where um, knowing the primary source information and what is mentioned and what isn't uh, gives you a far greater understanding of the nature of the problem. Uh, to work out what size uh, the arc needs to be would depend in part upon what's going in it, and that means defining how many kinds there are and how, what is the average size of the kind, or in fact, if you have a total list, you don't have to worry about average size. You'd have to work out totaling up every single example to figure out how many space is involved and how much poop is being produced over 40 days or in 40 nights and all the rest. All of which are technically resolvable logistical problems in terms of just the sheer numbers, but you can't do that if you can't get to step one of figuring out how many kinds there are. And once you discover that nobody, but nobody in the creationist biz ever bothers to lay out really how many kinds there are, they bandy numbers around, but they don't show any indication that they've ever tried to calculate them. In the uh, Proto Avis case, that was one where uh, uh, Jackson uh, had um, bumped into a fossil case of a supposed Triassic bird uh, that really wasn't a likely Triassic bird. And that uh, uh, was pretty clear once you knew the bigger field. And rather than him having to reinvent the wheel by tracking down this one little oddball source that he couldn't find the material on, I go, oh, I know about that. And so gave him uh, the information so then he could move beyond that because now he didn't have to repeat all the same work that had been done before. Uh, and the Jesus birth dates, that was, that was a wonderful example because uh, that's another pure uh, source analysis uh, for all of us in the atheist community where um, they try to, uh, uh, where biblical inerrantists try to defend that argument. Um, I just trot out a, a simple question. In what year was Jesus born? 
And the moment you ask that question, you're slamming into the problem between the Gospels of Matthew and Luke, which are the only sources in the, the Gospels uh, for Jesus's birth times. And they're hopelessly at odds. The difference between Herod era, uh, about 4 BC, and the, uh, the annexation of Israel in 6 AD, that's a decade. And uh, it, it's fascinating to watch as I go into a bit in the because uh, the Bible tells me so thing. Uh, I'll, I'll put up here as usual, not that it ever seems to do any good, um, the website link to my website uh, where um, I have all of my postings to uh, the YouTube channel and um, links to uh, the GoFundMe and Patreon that I'll put a plug up for in an intermission commercial. and. Um, Links to the books that I've done, uh, which I encourage everyone on the planet to buy because they're good stuff. And also, I'm an impoverished writer and I need the damn royalties. So, two good reasons. Uh, anyway, uh, we'll get back to um, what we've got going on here. Oh, Christina Blackfeather is saying, almost done with inking a drawing of Confucius Ornus, however it's spelled. That looks pretty darn close. Uh, finally working on my Birds or Dinosaurs 2 coloring book that I'm making. That sounds a rather fascinating process. Yeah, uh, the, the, the delicious problem and challenge with that, I would imagine, is keeping up with the paleontology because uh, we're in just a gangbuster era uh, where there's a way more access to a lot of the deposits. Uh, there's a lot of paleontology work going on in China these days, so you get constantly new fields of material discovered. And um, uh, the, the whole bird dinosaur field has expanded spectacularly. Um, an obscure one that you might want to put in there would be a coloring thing of, of one of the uh, proto feathers in amber. That's a real simple one to color because it would be just a blob and there would be the little filament thing with the little squiggles popping off of it. Uh, that's uh, one of the predicted proto feather forms uh, that was actually found in a uh, uh, amber deposit. So we've got, we now don't have to guess that the predicted transitional forms on feathers actually existed in a living animal. We've got physical proof of it in amber. So ta da! The fossil genie. Uh, as I describe him in uh, Slam Dunk, is ever busy. Um, uh, Christina says that, so what's funny is it's inspired by a six-year-old I care for who comes from a young Earth creationist family. Uh, well, yeah, kids love to color. And in fact, uh, it's very possible from a creationist context that they will have bumped into uh, creationist uh, coloring books on their own because there's a, a cottage industry of people, starting with Dwayne Gish back in the 1990s, to be sure, of uh, people who build up books that are catered to tell the kids about the truth of creation. And they know they got to do that, especially with dinosaurs, because the kids are really going to want to know about dinosaurs. And if they go running off to the library, they're going to get all that terrible stuff that mentions that tyrannosaurs ate meat and lived 60 billion years ago. Uh oh, we don't want that. So um, uh, they've got to construct a whole network of apologetic stuff geared at children. Uh, to reflect the dogmas and uh, get things going. I don't know that anyone's done any follow-up work uh, much to suggest that this is actually useless because um, if they are non-Tortucan kids, uh, the moment they discover the real data later on down the stream, whether it's in regular school or in college or on the internet or somewhere, um, they'll go, whoa, they've been sold a bill of goods and they'll discover what the facts are. So even though it will be a wheel-spinning delay for them, I'm not at all sure that it's actually all that effective, um, given the number of people who, like Pologia, who were ex-creationists who um, may have been involved in it in their own family environment, but then they discover what the facts are, and whoops, they have to move beyond it. Uh, Fino says, yes, likes the grape-eating riddable T-Rexes in Ham's Old Creation Museum. Yeah, uh, my favorite ones, there were two different versions. One, I think, was from Dwayne Gish, and I can't remember whether it was Ken Ham who was fielding the other ones, but, but they said that Tyrannosaurs ate either melons or a gnawed bark off of trees. And from a, a forensic point of view of what teeth do and what jaws do, and this goes all the way back to Baron Cuvier back in the early 19th century, who was no evolutionist. This is just comparative anatomy. I mean, that stuff is just cockamamie stupid. <laughs> Animals that eat certain kinds of things betray their diet 
about their body from the way their guts are arranged, from the way their eyeballs are arranged. Uh, prey animals tend to have uh, side eyeballs so that they can see broader vision than the binocular type predators that have to focus in on prey. Uh, the kinds of jaw structures that are involved, the shape of the teeth, the serration measures on the teeth, and even then in more recent fossils where you can actually measure uh, the isotope balances, there are characteristic isotope balances. Plus you got copper lights that um, actually preserve the stuff that it critters ate. In fact, one of the neat little bits that Christine Janis was delighted with in reading uh, Slam Dunk was uh, she discovered that stuff that she had missed in her own field uh, about the discovery of these little um, uh, uh, early uh, instances apparently of mammal hair showing up in the Permian. And it shows that uh, that kind of um, probably dates all the way back to the Permian. Uh, we, we have clear-cut examples way later of actually beautifully preserved with the fur in, um, uh, still as uh, impressions like feather impressions, but much, much later. And it was inferred that a lot of early mammals like Morgadukadon and all the rest probably were furry because they apparently had whiskers. And the reason you can tell that is because there are little indentations in the bone uh, where the nerve systems come in and attach. So all of this stuff has forensic cross connections that, by the way, creations pay no attention to. Uh, yeah, Be Beach Price, yeah, yeah, about to ask about copper lights. Ha, beat you to the punch. Yeah, it's, it's ancient critter shit. And uh, that's uh, part of the way we do things. It, it, it's really useful because uh, you can tell a lot about ecosystems, you can tell about climate by what pops up in the shit. Uh, and uh, since we're talking Permian, the only large animals uh, that were predators were therapsids predominantly. The diapsids were relatively trivial players all through the Permian period when our synapsid line that leads to the mammals were actually the dominant group. And everybody has seen one of them. Anybody that has an old dinosaur set or has seen a, a, a cheapy um, a dinosaur uh, uh, movie uh, has seen Dimetrodon, which is your classic finback reptile with a little um, fin on the back. Um, that dates from about, uh, yipes, uh, 240, 250 million years ago. And um, uh, they look conventionally reptilian because this is really early in the synapsid lineage. Um, uh, and we still don't know entirely sure of that whole bit about finback things. They pop up occasionally uh, in a variety of lineages. You see them in, in several groups uh, in the close relatives of Dimetrodon. And you can see indications of kind of enlarged spinal elements in their cousins like Sphenacodon. Uh, I think I mentioned this a little bit in Slam Dunk. More encouragement for people to buy Evolution Slam Dunk. And I will put the blurb up there, the title. Evolution Slam Dunk. Available from Amazon.com and available for email for ebooks and, and so forth and so on. Um, and um, I went into that quite a bit, um, and uh, the, the the fun part uh, is that it shows up occasionally in dinosaurs, which are, of course are on the diapsid line of things, and often really big ones. Spinosaurus is the spectacular example of this thing with this really big finback sail, uh, and there's a hadrosaur which is on a different lineage. Uh, that they all seem to be living in comparable areas. They're kind of hot, arid environments, uh, but the, the, the fiddly bit details in the ecology of them, there's still an ongoing concern in paleontology as to why they have them. Were they purely thermoregulatory uh, or were they sexual displays? Uh, what kind of functions did they have? Um, the, if you could go back in a time machine, the, the rule that I always have is you would have the duh that if you could see the living animal in its context, everything about it would make perfect sense. You'd know exactly why uh, it has the features that it does, and you'd be able to look at all the fiddly bits, and you'd be able to do all the genetics and analyze all of that, and they'd be happy, and you'd write papers on it. But we only have things way, 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 way removed uh, far from, from the field. Uh, and it's still a relevant debate that pops up as to whether or not the plates on stegosaurs uh, performed a sexual display role, a defensive role, a um, thermal regulatory role, or some combination of the above, and you get different ping pong matches going back and forth on it. It's probably the case that most of these weird little features are doing a bunch of different things. And the idea that um, some giant spinosaur would go into the spinosaur mate attraction dance and that they had somewhat broadly colored um, uh, skin flaps on their big 
protruding spine structures so that it was a sexual display going through a little bird mating dance like a bird is not at all implausible. Uh, along with the fact that they may also have functioned a bit as a thermoregulatory cooling system. You just turn yourself one way or the other. And the reason why they have them and other ones don't is because they're a relatively rare mutation chain and that most of the animals didn't form them and didn't need to form them. Smaller animals that uh, didn't need to worry about the thermoregulatory issue or bigger ones that uh, could manage it through other means. Um, if you looked at the individual animals, you'd be able to figure all this out. Yeah, Jackson Wheat says, yes, Oranosaurus. Lord Crocker Squirrel snottily says, Carl Baugh eats coprolites. Uh, no, that's not true, Crocker Squirrel. He only acts as if he's eaten coprolites. Uh, it's an entirely different matter. Uh, <laughs> so the uh, we're about uh, 20 minutes into the show here. Uh, to recap uh, the basic lessons that I've been trying to drum into everybody on source methods is whenever you're looking at any subject matter whatsoever, whether it's a technical paper, whether it's a general book, whether it's a video, whether it's something that somebody posts online, it doesn't matter. Uh, you're always looking at a map between the content and the, uh, um, the source base. And uh, regardless of the reputation of the person involved, if they're presenting just a generic uh, summary article, it doesn't mean it's inaccurate or accurate. It means it's a summary article. And whenever you are seeing stuff, if it's an area that you're particularly interested in and you have a little bit of the time, and in the internet era, everybody has a certain amount of time to do this now, you, what you want to try to do is to verify or ground it in a primary source. Those of you following me on Twitter should by now have spotted how relentless I am on the matter of primary sources. And so... And by the way, this is my trusty iced tea, although it looks like it's in something in a whiskey glass, but that's, that's, I drink that in a short glass because it's less likely. To, I have spilled over tall glasses of iced tea in enormously embarrassing contexts, so I'd much rather drink them in a short glass. Oh, Psy Strike. Here's a stump the RJ thought. Ever wonder if any evolutionary whoops species made it for a while through mere force of will? Ooh, they don't have force of will, but, te but tenacity, this is the whole issue. It's actually a good a relevant question, Psy Strike. It's, it's why do certain lineages have tenacity or not? Why do they go along? Uh, Stephen Jay Gould argued uh, that it was the luck of the draw, and the more um, adaptive minded ones say, no, it's because they were adaptive. And so the question is, is how much of it is just oops luck? And how much of it is just the tenacity of an animal that they have, they're a little more truculent? If you think about something with the temperament of a wombat, that just makes it and they go and all they have to do is to have one kid survive and then they defend it to the death uh, as opposed to the one that lays 15 eggs and bye bye we're off and you fend for yourself kids um some of those ones that have different breeding patterns may actually triumph and you could call a bit of that uh, will aspects it's not necessarily conscious uh one of the the interesting features is to look at what happens after mass extinctions and why mass extinctions occur and what makes it through the mass extinction or not. I, I allude to it a bit and there's uh, tip 1.2, I believe, uh, at my hashtag tip website is on the mass extinction issue. And I, I surveyed a lot of the technical issues on the causation matter. I didn't go into an enormous amount on the biology elements, but alluded to some sources on it. I was mainly looking more at the trigger factors, which involve largely um, magma plumes, uh, occasional asteroid impacts, and some other factors, maybe even a gamma ray burst, I think, in the case of the Devonian one, uh, or Ordovician one. Um, but um, it's interesting as to what survives and what doesn't. And uh, you get the, the general picture is that you've got a mix of animals that are doing pretty good, but then start getting stressed, perhaps, by volcanic eruptions and other things. And then something comes along like an asteroid impact that's just one bad thing too many, and the system collapses. And it does it relatively rapidly. And it doesn't obliterate everything. And some of the stuff survives maybe by luck of the draw or maybe because they have adaptations. And the dinosaur case is probably the most interesting because we know that other than the feathered flying dinosaurs, every other dinosaur died out. Uh, there's occasional rumors that there may be a ceratopsian or few that pops up in post-KT deposits, but no one's ever been able to track that down thoroughly. And so it's very, very problematic. And so even to this day, it looks like 
all the non-avian dinosaurs checked out. 100% failure rate. And that includes everything from little itty-bitty animals all the way up to gigantic things the size of brachiosaurs. Um, you have to wonder then why the birds made it since theropods that were comparably massed didn't. And one of the possibilities is the duh, birds can fly. So they can move to higher ground. They can go up into what's left of the tree. They can uh, hide themselves away from things in different contexts. They can migrate. Um, and also another factor that may bear in mind is to whether they're omnivores, whether they are good at eating insects and the like, and we know how resilient insects are. I think only one of the mass extinctions in history, um, I think the Permian was the only one that was so severe that it actually bumped into the insects, which are largely mass extinction proof. Boy, those cockroaches, they just are diligent and durable. Um, another puzzler involves ones that maybe estivate. Uh, frogs managed to make it through. Quite a lot of crocodiles and, and a lot of reptiles. So you, it, the, the warm-blooded, cold-blooded issue is, is a complex one, and the ecosystem matter is a, is a, is a fascinating one. Now, another factor that, that speaks against creationism. Ooh, uh, Systrike says, do you think we should ask RJ for his opinion about the Navigator in the new Star Trek series? Well, I only saw the opening episode because I don't have money enough to actually subscribe to the streaming CBS service. So it looked like a really good series and it looked like fun actors, solid performers in there. Uh, the, the, uh, the Chinese actress that plays the captain in the first one from Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, I have adored for years. Wow, as she got stage presence and is gorgeous. And uh, I've always uh, enjoyed her a lot. And so just to see her helming the ship for even that one episode was just delightful. Uh, yeah, it looks like it's a really good series. And I, and I, um, uh, we might we might look at the artificial intelligence people on, on the Orville while we're at it. That one I can see because that's on Fox. Uh, so I have access to that. Um, Jackson asks, do you think dinosaurs became so successful originally because of their urinary efficiency? Paleos posits that as a hypothesis. I haven't heard that of directly, but it wouldn't necessarily survive, uh, surprise me. We do know that there were a lot of dinosauromorphs knocking around in the period, and we're talking uh, late Triassic, at around the time that the full-blown mammals are arising, but, and the climate is starting to break up, uh, it's becoming, uh, or, or rather alter from a, a more temperate to a more tropical climate, more stable temperatures as Pangaea uh, is, is forming in the Triassic. Later on, it'll be starting to break up. Uh, but another factor involves the fact that, let's not overlook the obvious, that you've got the bipedality issue. Uh, that you've got a bunch of dinosauromorphs, Lagosuchids and others, that are teeter-totter shaped critters, ba balancing on the hind legs. And that seems to be kind of useful. It frees up the arms to do interesting, fun stuff, that the earliest dinosaurs are all that kind of layout. Herrerasaurs the same way, which are now regarded as very, very close cousins to the um, um, stem group for uh, the sauropod line, lineage of the Cerisians and that the theropod line in the latest taxonomy is actually a side branch that is more closely related to the Ornithischian line that breaks off later. Um, and that didn't surprise me a great deal. But the, the idea that uh, birds um, uh, well, uh, do poop, but they don't actually urinate. And I'm not entirely sure all the details about how what, what kind of um, uh, stuff the, uh, the dinosaurs did. But it, it could easily play a role. I, the one thing I want to avoid in all uh, thinking in evolutionary history is the nothing buttery, uh, that you've got the, uh, the, one in, the one and only thing that's the big factor. Evolution probably runs from lots of things all going on at once. And the, the worst mistake that you can do in conceptualizing the past is forgetting that everything at any given moment of time slice is enormously varied so that you've got um, uh, ecological relationships and the biology of individual organisms and the parasites and the bacteria that you can't tell what was going on inside of there that was making a role in the same way. How would you know that Komodo dragons make use of deadly bacteria that live in their saliva so that they can basically make life miserable for you if they just eat you and uh, bite you a bit and then wait for you to drop over from all of the parasitical uh, bacteria that are now attacking you and then they can come in for the kill. Uh, Jackson continues, uh, they, they say that dinosaurs could conserve water more efficiently than early mammals so they could adapt to the post-KT extinction deserts better. Um, that's a possibility. 
uh, another factor involves niche partitioning. Uh, there's a good argument that's been made that therapsids and the, the early mammals had developed uh, a tendency toward nocturnality for quite a while before um, the, uh, the uh, um, uh, uh, Permian-Triassic extinction. And so they're basically a big long windup uh, for living in spots that the day dominating dinosaurs didn't. Uh, even today, look at the number of birds that operate at night and you're talking owls. And I think that's about it. A lot of owls, but nevertheless, it took a long time for that to develop uh, for nocturnal vision. Uh, it isn't that they necessarily couldn't see it all at night, but uh, all the evidence suggested the dinosaurs would do in their shtick primarily during the day. And that meant that the mammals had the night to themselves. They could run around and cre creep around and eat the insects and all that. And even to this day, uh, the bats, uh, that there's a circumstantial argument that bats are evolving at about the same time as the late Cretaceous period. So they actually predate the KT extinction. Not We don't know any fossil confirmation of this yet because they're a really bad record for, for bats in general and they're hard to preserve. But the genetic information suggests that they go back that far. That bats are really ones that proliferate in areas where the birds aren't. So they, they're night flyers in an environment where the birds dominate during the day. And I think that dynamic probably played a great deal of role on that. But yeah, the idea that there would have been aspects of their, their urination factors in their metabolism. They had a complex metabolism that isn't quite what we're used to in any living organism. We know the birds, their descendants, have a higher thermostat than mammals do. Uh, and so it's very possible that there were theropods that functioned on that. And that's part of the issue about whether feathers develop in part as a thermoregulatory system for little birthing chicks. And there, there are a lot of little details that we can't really tell yet from, from the fossil data. Let me check our questions over here. Uh, oh, well, Fino was talking about tardigrades. I'm not sure that tardigrade biology and scale 10,000 does make any sense. Oh, was that, you got a critter that looks like a giant tardigrade? Those are creepy little critters, little water bears. Uh, they're fabulous. Uh, they look like a, um, a weird pudgy blob with little bitty, bitty stubby feet and this, this nozzle of a mouth. And I'm not sure if they've got eyes or if they are. They're little teeny beady things that are kind of far back and nobody really notices or not. So I'm not sure whether tardigrades have vision or not. Uh, but they look like something out of a science fiction movie. In fact, the phyla are things that look like things out of a science fiction movie. If you actually look closely, anything that you, you require a microscope to see, if you scale it up to the size of an oxen, you'd be scared shitless out of them. So yeah, you're running for your life. Ah! The attack of the tardigrades. Uh, they're fabulously resistant to uh, temperature variations. You can freeze the damn things in a block of ice for a long time and they'll be perfectly fine when you thaw them out, which is more than can be said for us vertebrates. We are, are relatively unresilient that way. So which one of us is more superior, the tardigrade who can withstand freezing or the vertebrate that can only make rocket ships? Uh, well, anyway. <laughs> ah, and uh, Fino uh, says, could it be the other way around? At night, so many predators were around that leaving your nest unguarded was a bad idea and going to hunt during daylight was the better choice. Also uh, entirely possible, Fino. That's, that's another variable that um, uh, it, it, to look at what the ecology of the night was uh, is really kind of interesting to see. Uh, and we don't have a time machine to be able to go back there. We know that there were lots of mammals. And in fact, that by the time you get towards the tail end of the Cretaceous, you're starting to have mammals that are about the size of a wombat or bigger and that are actually apparently hunting dinosaur eggs. So that they're getting kind of aggressive and they're able to eat small dinosaurs. Uh, and of course, we know that there are, are crocodiles around. Uh, my favorite one of the, I think, Dinosuchus that's big enough that it could easily chomp on a dinosaur. The, the smaller dinosaurs would be no problem for anything that ventured too close to the water with that. Those things are monstrous. They're like 50 feet long. We, we have a much impoverished array of crocodiles, and I'm kind of glad for that, uh, that we don't have nearly the, as great a diversity of, of life today as we had a long time ago. The, the last ice age creamed off an awful lot too for complex reasons that go into a lot of other stuff. Oh yeah, Lord Quarker Squirrel there. Tardigrades will happily hang out in hard vacuum or even in soft vacuum. It depends on you know whether or not you have a velvet lined vacuum or not. So, <laughs> um, we're about halfway through. Let me uh, do my shameless plug here. 
um, I'm trying to do because I'm a pathetic, desperate person who is dependent on, um, now I got to find my bloody way to that stupid little menu. Come on, come on. There we go. Screen share. A little thing out there. And we'll let that hang up a little while while I talk. I will thank uh, the uh, tip patrons so far on patreon.com. There's the website link down there. I've added the blip about tortukan.wordpress.com. That's kind of the overlord of sites because there's links to my books there. There's uh, links to the video channel. Uh, there's uh, links to debates and things that I've done, and plus all the PDF stuff that's up there, both the new modules and the older tip work. It's all open access stuff. Make use of it. There's the portable map of time. Uh, all of you looking around there, hey, say hi. There's there's comment channels at uh, hashtag tip. You can go down to the tab and put a little blurb in there and say, hello, how you doing? But anyway, we got Steven, we got John, we got Direwolf and Eat Meal and Mona and Jen and Jody and Staggles and Totes Rio and Paul uh, on our patrons, and we could sure use more. Uh, or you could donate uh, directly at the GoFundMe.com DCGo, which is um, uh, another route to do. Uh, I'm um, a pathetic wretch who um, has to depend on public patronage and the book sales and all the rest to get by. I just got on Medicare, which meant they just chopped 140 more bucks out of my Social Security check, and that's making October a kind of busy time. And I don't know yet whether or not there's going to be more coming in in compensation um, in October because of the Medicare thing. And at the moment, then, I'm just going, ah! Um, I don't know uh, what the hell I'm doing. Well, we'll stop sharing that little bit, and um, we can close that one off, and then you get to see my mug rather than the um, important area. Um, the, um, the work that I've been trying to do, and I will summarize that for any of you who are not seeing this, uh, oh, Fino 3000, cough, you can make the technical symbols invisible before saving the graphic, RJ. Yeah, I bet I can, but I'm a doofus at this. I, I, it, this is the very first year I've ever actually done videos like this. I didn't even have a camera to do that with. Thank you very much, uh, dear uh, uh, Justin, who is uh, a local friend of mine and uh, a secular advocate and the like, and he donated the camera that I'm using. And Jackson Wheat... Hey, kid, you're the reason why I got this. Uh, suddenly, I had a package drop on my doorstep with, and contained this because people were saying I was having get feedback from the fact that I had to listen to over the uh, speakers that I had. And so I'm literally a process of uh, the donations and things that people have helped with. Um, I'd like to have enough money to be able to not only pay bills and get a telephone again, uh, but also theoretically to be able to do the work in getting books. Um, I put up, in fact, um, uh, uh, I think uh, uh, Marianne on Twitter uh, said that I, no, 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 it's uh, Jade on Twitter. Uh, she was saying that I should do a, a wish list at Amazon, and I did. So I put up an assortment of um, some books and, frankly, some videos since I haven't been able to get those in a long time. But the, the books are more important. Things like Zombie Science by Jonathan Wells. Uh, that's one of his new diatribe books. I'm sure it's largely repetitive uh, from what has happened before. But as Jackson can attest and anybody else that's read my work in detail can see, that another work that's repeating a lot of the same arguments can actually help nail people because here they are trotting out the same material over again, or they're bringing up new material and playing the same tricks with them. And the only way you can do that and study that is to see the original material. And you got to be able to see the notes and what references they're citing and what they aren't, which brings us back to the subject at hand, which are the three layers of uh, scholarly analysis. Um, in TIP, I've been trying to get everybody up to where they're operating at that third level, of you know the whole data stream as much as possible. And uh, oh, Fino is asking uh, about what about roaches and the herpes virus? What about roaches and the herpes virus? I'm not aware of that. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, if, if you could, Fino, and jump, I don't know if you have a camera or not, um, throw caution to the wind. And um, I will, uh, since I have the power to kick anybody out if they are nitwit, in case Edgar decides to show up. but. There's the link for the, um, I hope that will come up any minute now. The um, 
Come, come there. Boop, boop, boop. Yep, there's the Hangouts. Um, if somebody has a camera, or I don't know if Fino uh, can jump in on that, but I'm not entirely sure what he means by the roaches and herpes virus. Um, I would think there's the possibility that the herpes virus is running around inside of roaches and that therefore roaches help spread them, uh, or that roaches got infected by something else that helps that and they help spread them. These are all theoretical possibilities. Oh, Fino, I have neither a camera nor a microphone on the computer. Darn, darn, darn. A paranormal yells, Pug! Um, oh, well, so much for that. Anyway, um, the neat thing about that scholarly methods approach, as I pointed out to Jackson and others, it's a game Tortukans can't play. It's not that they're bad at it. It's they can't do it at all conceptually. The very thing you need to do to be a fair source analysis is, one, you want to know what the data are, which means playing on that third field. You want to play fair with all of your sources, which means not misreading stuff, independent of whether it's a primary or a secondary source. And ideally, you want to ground it as much as possible. Aha, Lord Cockleswell! I would have joined you a while ago, except that I didn't have a link. I went and hunted Twitter and everything. Yeah, oh, well, I, I'm trying to, uh, I, I dump it into a, an assortment of ones uh, on the Twitter, and I probably miss a few people on that and uh, try to do the best on that. So your take so far on my exposition on the importance of source scholarship in the field. Oh no, as far as I, as far as I can tell, you're 100% correct. You've got to know what you're talking about, and the only way to do that is to go looking for the actual sources. <coughs> yeah. And then try to figure out the what The one delicious... Yeah. yeah. The thing you got, it's step three that you're actually, that you actually have to worry about because you know where the hell they're actually getting their claim from and what they're leaving behind because I, I, yeah. I can think of any number of creations I've jumped that way. They hate it when I do that. Oh, yeah. And I go into a bunch of them in Slam Dunk uh, to where, uh, and Coulter, for example, uh, the delicious uh, anti-evolutionist harpy. Um, it, it reached the stage when I finally got around to analyzing her reptile mammal transition thing that there was no doubt whatsoever who she had relied on for a particular claim on the jaw transition issue. Mm -hmm. It was obvious that she was relying on Philip Johnson. Why? Because he was literally the only source she could have relied on because he was the only one that ever made that suite of claims. So when you get to the level of where you know the background material in that level, uh, I, 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 my sister um, years ago uh, expressed amazement that I could read so much anti-evolution stuff without vomiting. <laughs> and I was saying that advantage, because when you read lots and lots of material, uh, the, uh, you'll discover traits of behavior. You'll see, you're, you're basically opening up the hood of their brain because they reveal things just as I reveal things about myself by how I write, how I construct an argument. You can mm -hmm. see how I think actually do the argument and everybody can do that but the the anti-evolutionist uh that relies too much on parasitical citations um that's going to show up the moment ah tony murphy has joined the video call introduce yourself tony tony is silent i don't think your your uh, um microphones are everything wrong so uh, when Tony decides not to be mute, uh, Tony can jump in and say, shut up, Jim. Um, the, the, the one thing that I want to stress to everybody about why source methods analysis is such a killer app now, we live in a world in which we have so much information available freebie online. I have seen this by direct inspection. When I was doing the tip work back in the 1990s, when I was first starting out thinking I could maybe write a book because I had some neat scoops on this new guy, Kent Hovian, that nobody had ever heard of before, and that's <laughs> it was that new. Uh, yeah, he was oh, yeah. way off the radar. And uh, I was starting to notice him, and then, of course, I had all this material about Philip Johnson because he was so smart, and yet he was screwing up so spectacularly, and I had a whole bunch of stuff that nobody had ever pinned him on. And then Richard Milton, who's still a minor character, but he's my poster child for scholarly incompetence, and I go into him a lot in Dynamania, uh, the uh, uh, chapter three from the old tip work. And so I, I felt I had enough new stuff to do a, a genuine contribution from the book level, but I still was hampered it was to get primary sources. 
uh, particularly geology and paleontology stuff. They just weren't easily accessible. And you would have to subscribe to them or you'd have to go to a college uh, to look up their background material. I'd have to do pilgrimages out to Eastern, my university, or go down to Gonzaga, which had an open access library and, I, and still does. Uh, but a lot of the obscure material or older material was really beyond the pale. You couldn't get to it. That was in the old days. But I now have a, a measurement that of primary source documentary material, probably 80 to 90 percent of it's available free online somewhere. All you got to do is poke. And so and there's no hard, excuse. If you hard enough, it might poke back. <laughs> Oh, yeah, we had poked back a lot. Some of it's just hilarious. Um, the, the thing, I, I love doing it because I despise Dinesh D'Souza. Uh, but the, there was a thing where he was uh, doing his uh, screed about the big lie. Mistake of putting up an, a, uh, an excerpt of the book on that noted science channel, Breitbart. And, um, uh, so I now had about a four or five page excerpt from the book, which had six footnotes in it. And the, the right one off the bat was the false Sanger quote that he had got from Richard Weikert's anti-evolution book, which I had in my library because it falls on my turf, so I could check that one. And the one that, that I was fascinated with was this Papineau and Johnson thing from this book they'd written in 1918 on eugenics. Boy, there's a late a, a, a new book. And I was thinking, holy shit, how am I ever going to fact check this thing? Okay. Oh, Just a moment, RJ. I'll check. Yeah, jump in. I um... Mr. Tony, if you would be so kind as to raise the gain on your mic, I did hear I did hear you laughing, but I can't. But oh, okay, yeah. Well, I want you to introduce yourself. You're you're sitting there uh, looking with this yeah. Cheshire chat grin. Well, I I always have that grin when I hear you speak, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but you've got the accent, man. What I sound like Mr. That? Geek. <laughs> Can you hear me okay? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. It's it's a little low, but but you could probably raise the gain up even more. But the thing that, that was so fascinating about uh, uh, the Papineau thing was that Project Gutenberg, which I've actually discovered quite a lot from Project Gutenberg, they, they go through and they document a, a huge range of works, um, theological works and historical works. It's just a, an astonishing amount of stuff. They're often in HTML format, but then more recently they've generated PDF versions. And so... Oh, Christmas in October, uh, it turned out that uh, Papineau and Johnson's uh, uh, 1918 eugenics book was part of their archive. So I was able to download the whole bloody book, 400, 500 pages long. And uh, it, it, now I could actually analyze this, and this is kind of relevant. It turned out that the claim that Dinesh D'Souza was making about it was cockamamie, flat out, head up your ass wrong. Never said what Dinesh claimed it was. And Sorry, uh, I, I, I got are, are you are you are you seriously suggested that Dinesh D'Souza was liberal with the truth? <laughs> no, yes, that's not what yes, he says. Yes, he's he's not merely liberal with the truth. He's downright radical Marxist with the truth. I haven't seen such data parsing since the Politburo. Uh, you know. yeah, his 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 relationship with the truth has always been the way I describe X Factor entrance with the melody, i.e. They go backwards and forwards across it without ever actually making contact yeah, with it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but then he, he, you got to realize, gentlemen, gentlemen, you have to realize mm -hmm. that Dinesh D'Souza has always, always, always had a very severe case of, of uh, cranial rectal inversion. There is that. Well, yes. Methods point of view. He is just par for the course. His methodology is indistinguishable from a flat earther or creationist. In that. Yeah. Absolutely. Overly addicted to secondary sources, and he can't even read primary sources, and he only chooses data that reinforces what he wants to be true. Well, that's the essence of what it means to be a, a head up your ass ideologue, that they are data f uh, a dogma first and data only where convenient, and they don't even vet that very well. So he, yeah. he has a very patrician quality about him. Uh, the, mm -hmm. I was fascinated with his Spanish Inquisition claim uh, that he did in the, <laughs> Oh, you don't know about that one, uh, uh, Doc? I do know about that one. That, oh, Doc doesn't know? 
No, I know. Uh, l- uh, let me well, give you a brief I, I summary. Don't. There's a video on it that I did. In uh, The very first thing I did on the Dinesh D'Souza thing was his claims about climate change in the Spanish Inquisition. He had popped up on my scope back in his book. I think it was from 2006 or seven, and it's in my tip bibliography. Anybody can hunt around for it to, to find the background information on it. I encourage people to read my damn stuff. Anyway, uh, <laughs> yes, the... Um, uh, in his book, What's So Great About Christianity or What Makes Christianity So Great, that was the, the subject of the book. And it was a, a stirring, stirring defense of how fabulous and wonderful uh, Christianity has always been. And he therefore had to kind of deal with some problems, like in things like the Inquisition. And uh, so along the way, and I actually had found out about this because an excerpt of this was put on side. That's how I spotted it to begin with. And then my jaw dropped because he said, you know, the Spanish Inquisition really wasn't so bad after all. Whoa. Uh, Swing that bias again, Dinesh. And his two arguments were that one, uh, they they hadn't really killed all that many people. The people had said they'd kill way tens, hundreds of thousands of people. No, it was only a few thousand over 300 years. It's not really all that serious. And secondly, that they didn't really target Jews. They were accused of being anti-Semitic. They didn't really do that. Well, my jaw dropped at this point, my evolved therapsid jaw. And I, I thought, okay. Uh, I, yeah. So I, I found the book at the library, checked it out, and, and looked up. And it turned out he based his entire argument on one source by Henry Kamen, which actually was a really good book. I yeah, very much enjoyed it. And in fact, I recommend Dinesh read it sometime because he clearly had missed its contents. Um, the, the, the part, the first mistruth that he had done was the bit about how many people got killed. Yes, it's true. Well, uh, Cayman actually had gone around and actually totaled up the various uh, uh, regions in Spain and, and figured out how many people actually were killed uh, in the Inquisition during those periods. And it c- came up to a few thousand people. Uh, although if you are one of the 3,000 in excruciating agony as your flesh is burned off your body, uh, uh, are you really concerned the fact that the death toll was misestimated by people in the 20th century? I don't think that's really going to be much of a comfort for you. But anyway, um, the, the the first problem was Cayman had pointed out 3,000 wasn't the tougher limit of what they wanted to do. They were so bloody inefficient that an awful lot of people they would have liked to have killed just fled town. They had, in one case, um, a, a blanket uh, indictments for a bunch of potential heretics in this town, 3,000 of them in one go. The whole village basically moved as a result of it. And all of this was in the Cayman book. Uh, and then the other really serious, nasty one involved the anti-Semitic uh, issue. From the point of view, a lot of people may not know how incredibly stratified the Spanish culture was. I knew about it from the old history and that that I'd studied, that if you were a pure blood Spaniard who moved to America to become a viceroy, born in Mexico were lower class than if you had stayed back home in Madrid because it was that stratified a system. They literally had names for the various layers of pecking order. And uh, so it it, it was like uh, a far more even than the Nazis in terms of how terribly racist level they were. And what they had to deal with were the various Jews who had lived in the Spanish culture uh, in various states of persecution, uh, depending upon the circumstance. Sometimes it was better to live in the Christian side. Sometimes it was better to live in the Muslim side. But now everything was Christian because Ferdinand and Isabel had conquered the country and unified it. Uh, A lot of Jews had either converted to Christianity by directly, or they were conversos whose children just simply now were Christians. And a lot of these conversos were becoming very prominent in the regime, in running things, in in the ministries, in the government and all that. In other words, they were getting uppity. Enormous resentment of these in the part of the pure bled bread, you know, we're almost like the, the muggles issue uh, and the, 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 uh, the half bloods that you pop up in uh, J.K. Rowling or this kind of stuff blood, that you blood. see. Yeah, blood fiction blood. can give us fiction can give us a mirror to the historical reality. Well, well the Spaniards well, actually did that sort of thing. Well, I was, was going to say, actually, Jim, I was going to say, actually, that, that the fiction is a really good guide to this. Anybody who spent any time watching all the old, um, you know, the old Pathé Zorro uh, things, Zorro was a great guide to what was going on. 
and and actually was that there was a great insight into into kind of what happened there. Who who is Lord oh, yeah. by the way? I see Lord on the screen. I have no idea who this is. I'm interacting with, or or I rather, who I'm world. seeing possibly while Jim goes motor mouth. <laughs> yes, Lord Crocus 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 Yeah, he's over on my ne neck of the woods. He lives on the, the the wet side of Washington State. I'm on the dry side. Uh, anyway, the right okay. the wet side is going to get colder than the the, the dry side is going to get colder than the wet side, and we're expecting. It oh yeah, it's already the cold. temperatures are dipping down in here. I'm afraid my heater is going to have to go on, and I don't have uh, but half a tank in my in my oil tank, so I'm I'm trying to keep the temperatures down. I'm wearing sweaters. So listen. Anyway, back listen, to Jim. Jim, I didn't I didn't know how you love to motor mouth. It's great. <laughs> yeah, but, but just jump in and say shut up. Good. The the the, the, re the reason the reason I want to shut you up is because, um. I uh, I know how difficult it can be as a fellow um, author, stroke rationalist, stroke, you know, um, all of those things. How difficult it can be to draw attention to and raise raise awareness and or funds for um, to to make things progress the way we want to. What is it that you need at the moment? What what what's you know, to make the TIP project work, what's good for you? What oh, do you need? Gee whiz, I, I have been hoping I could just get a bloody crowd moving. Uh, there are thousands of people. I got 1,900 followers on Twitter. I mean, Strike has got thousands of followers. Everybody's got thousands mm. of followers around there. If if the even a big chunk of those just plop five stupid bucks at GoFundMe, that collectively would do it jump ahead to the things that I, I i love to have that level of things i don't ever want anybody to yes, impoverish yeah. themselves or to have to sell the grandmother yeah um, and, and and like, plus, like you like you i know that like you i know that but it it also needs to be said sometimes it's i i know as a as a, as a fellow and to puerto rico Puerto Rico and the hurricane relief, frankly, takes precedent because I've got a roof over my Definitely. head at the moment. I've got food in my belly. I've got a, a, a shelter. I'm not in that level. Whereas people, if somebody has a choice between plumping money down for Puerto Rico relief or me, as much as I'd like it, I hope they do Puerto Rico first because that's, yeah, that's, definitely. that's something so, where people, they, they blasted the smithereens down there. I agree completely. I mean, at the moment, Patreon is my, Patreon and donations from my blog are my only source of income. I have, I'm not working. I, I write, mm -hmm. I write, that's all I do. So That kind of a thing. I, I bid off this project that. because I, and I can't give the damn thing up. Uh, and uh, I've got two books out. That's another one where I was actually told by some people when they were seeing that how slow the GoFundMe was ramping up and it has yet to ramp up. Uh, they said, you need to put up something for sale. Buy some of your material and sell it. And I didn't want to just simply take three macroevolutionary episodes, which was already free, and suddenly sell it for money somewhere no that I, I couldn't do that in good conscience so I literally had to write no, it's tricky, isn't it? which is what I did with uh, with slam dunk and I'm very proud of that one I think that's a, a niche filler I've been using the tip Definitely. project as a way to guide my research direction so when I decided well what am I gonna write on that nobody has done before I need to know what nobody had done before and the one that jumped right out at me was the reptile mammal transition no book on yeah. this subject you had you had works by Kemp and others that were designed for paleontologists, but they're not popular works, and they're not telling you about how creationists deal with it. So this was completely virgin turf. That the reptile mammal transition was way too spectacular uh, to to avoid on this area, and um, I, I, as part of the self-serving pat down it on the back thing people to read the book and talk about it and review it if they're on goodreads anywhere else spread the word about it or for that matter uh, anybody that wants to harangue jerry coin or some of the people upstairs in these departments and say hey here's something you need to pay attention to and uh, if you can give us support for it or uh, talk about it please do so well maybe uh, i, can I think the work stands by itself maybe i can There's help with some of that Maybe I can help with some of that. I mean, I, 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 my work is in, is geared towards some of the same things in that in that I'm, I'm about how we think about things, 
and it's largely to do with how we use logic in everyday life how we or how actually how most of us logic how we abuse it how we how we don't think clearly about it's in everyday life but um i do association with the rationalist movement i do have i do have some people that that, that could perhaps make uh, some noise on this behalf yeah and all the noise so maybe, uh, maybe i can help with that but what we need is what we need is people who have actual genuine genuine connections yes yeah and, and large follower accounts, you know up in the hundreds of thousands rather than just in the thousands exactly yeah and I, I i can't do it alone none of us can do it alone uh, no, indeed. If, if we're talking beyond just my ability to pay bills there's a larger thing that i'm hoping to construct here which doesn't yet exist and it is a genuine science strike force network of we've got people all yeah. over the planet all different places where if any creationist or woo believer pokes their head up somebody theoretically is in their general area that can take note of it and draw upon yeah. the, the wisdom of the crowd of all the vast expertise that everybody in the network would have in such a way that you can then marshal a response if it's possible and as well documented as possible yeah and i've done some M much here video yeah jump in indeed and, and i think i think that you you like me i'm a, I'm a big fan of moles they, they get a hard time. I don't think we should be whacking a mole. I think we should be whacking a creationist. And we, we have enough people around the world to make sure that they get properly whacked every time. It, it's like as a, as amusing and entertaining as it is, a snark at flat earthers. They're absolutely inconsequential. Whereas we have people ah. making decisions for us now in the Trump administration who are creationists and that demographic we had jolly well better pay attention to here and frankly ah. things counterparts of that in Europe. I do have a counter to that, uh, which is that um, in actual fact, flat earth movement, movement is backdoor creationism and, it, and in fact, Large amounts of money that Mike Pence, for example, is a flat earther. I think that the, 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 the what's happened. Oh, I, I don't know. I don't know that he's a flat earther. Uh, uh, RJ, the man is correct. Pence is a flat earther. There are several others to the same type, and there is already there, we're already starting to feel a little bit of a push on the education system. Yeah. To um, consider this actually, alternate theory. If you, if you have a source of where Pence has expressed an opinion on on flat Earth, please fire it at me because I do uh, want to have that for my data set. Uh, well, well, the the thing is, and and you're right to ask for that. But here's the thing: the reason that the flat Earth movement is growing is simply because the creationists have been beaten back so badly. This is actually the same movement. These are all the same people. Like you, Jim, I've been involved in this for quite a long time. Uh, t two decades I've been active in the rationalist movement. And my experience has been that many of the people who were arguing for creationism, the, the, the general evolution deniers in the early days, are the same ones who are arguing flat earth now. The simple fact mm. is the whole flat, earth, whole flat earth movement is biblical. And it is all about well, science. That, that, that's people, that's, that's true. The flat Earth said and always has been of kind of geocentrism, which is a subset of anti-evolutionism. Uh, but uh, mm. in all the couple thousand of anti-evolutionists that I track, and certainly all the gang at the Discovery Institute and Answers in Genesis and all the rest, but even the wingnut moving and all that bunch, these are not flat earthers. They're they're and they're not showing no. any sign of becoming flat earthers. No, and there's a good reason for that. There's a good reason for that because the the the, the well organized and well funded creationists are well aware that what they're actually doing is lying. That this they don't 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 be taken in by the by the the, the crap that you Dwayne Gishes and you 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 know you Ken Hams and you you uh, oh, but Banana Man's and all of these people, all of these people. They are fully aware that they are engaged in an act of deception. However, they're also not stupid enough to to to, to land into some area where there is no controversy. 
what's happening is this movement is coming from the grassroots of the creationists but it is fundamentally a creationist movement the whole flat earth illusion you won't find any any rational person who believes in in, in flat earth you won't actually find many people in christianity you do even though this is what their biblical cosmology says but it's still the same the same movement so we have to challenge them on every area where they where they come up against science and it's why for example i give equal time to creationists flat earthers anti-vaxxers all of them for me the people who argue against science are all the same people who are arguing that who are arguing for biblical creation there's no difference between them and it's the same with the racists and the you know uh, this is this is one movement this is anti reality that i argue against and they're all the same people see what i'm saying i i, I get where you're coming from and your work is i can issue with you on one thing uh, in that in from my perspective viewing it in terms of this tortukan model of the mind the ability of what happens mm -hmm. when you have a mind that doesn't think about things they don't want to think about for me that accounts for virtually all of anti-evolutionism and i don't see yes. any indication that any of the major figures in anti-evolutionism or for that matter people at the grassroots level have the slightest sense in which they think they are uh, uh, believing things that aren't true uh, the, the extent to which they dissemble or the, descent, the extent to which they use tactics in order to further the thing is where they know there's a problem in certain areas and they want to avoid minefield. Uh, the, the role that intelligent designers have had to consciously just never think about any of their young earth creationist allies uh, is an example of that. But I, I, I don't call that um, a, 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 um, a, a, a lying aspect in terms of the content. I don't think that a Steve Meyer or for that matter a Ken Ham whatsoever believes that what they believe isn't true uh, and that they're just in it for the money or something like that. No, I, I'm absolutely convinced that they're completely convinced that all of this stuff is true. I'm I'm less convinced. I think that um, I, I I think it's easy to apply Hanlon's razor here and to think that 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 is it's stupidity and ignorance. But I don't think that anybody that ignorant can be that successful. Um, that, you know, oh, oh, there are conflicting ideas. There are conflicting the ideas. Aren't factors. That's why Philip Johnson and Richard Milton are such interesting exemplars here, because nobody can argue uh, that these are stupid people. Uh, uh, Philip Johnson got into Harvard when he was 16. For those of you who are not familiar with Johnson, he was now in kind of semi-retirement. He had a stroke of, uh, quite a few years back, and so he's not active. But he's basically the guy that jump-started intelligent design, the whole avatar of the movement, enormously. <laughs> He got into Harvard when he was 16. He was a very bright guy. <laughs> and yet, the moment you look at him from the source methods direction, you can see how his mind is not thinking about things he doesn't want to think about, how he dances away from subject matter, how he credulously relies on secondary sources that he doesn't fact check. Exactly the same property that a Jaron would be doing in Jaronism uh, is happening yeah. here. Richard Milton is another example. He was, I don't know whether he's still head of British Mensa or not. And he's a minor player on, on the scene. About the only people who take him seriously are a, a small smattering of young earth creationists. But remember, the methodological nature of the problem, it doesn't depend on how popular the guy is. It's just how he constructs arguments. Right. And he, he is just right. addicted. He would copy an entire chapter of Thomas Kuhn's Structure of Scientific Revolutions into his book, <laughs> complete with stuff translated from the German that obviously Kuhn had done the translation, not him. And yet he treats it as if he has uh, done all this material himself. Once you have yeah. a mind that does that, Great for book, an by the way. awful lot of, of behavior, because they, their, their brains, you can literally see, if, if you've seen the little video that I did, it was a rudimentary one that I tried to do uh, on uh, introducing the Tortukan concept, and I was pointing out the deer in the headlight moment that if you ask somebody a, a question that falls within their Tortukan ruts, you get this blank stare moment, and they'll maybe answer a question that you didn't ask. Have, have they'll you seen go my, off into something else. Have you seen my post on cognitive inertia, patterns in the, the inertia of ideas? I seem to, uh, I no, seem no. to recall that bit. Yeah, well worth a look, well worth a look, because it, it I mean, you, uh, 
I must must circle back to Tortukin because I've been meaning to ask you for a while where that comes from. But oh. the, the post I'm talking about is is it's really about um, it, it is it's actually largely to do with what King was talking about in his work, but it is actually a more general term because he was talking about the inertia of ideas in science. Yeah, and yeah, how, and the, how kind of the old paradigm should die out and so and that, on. Still, uh, but controversial, but shouldn't be. I mean, it's kind of like a duh thing that that you get a matter of yeah. country. You get cliques in any discipline. It's not just science; it's everything. And you get people that that fight battles that are long ago, and then a new generation comes along that's independent of it, and they can start making fresh decisions. And sometimes the thing goes away. The Tartukan term is: I wanted a term to describe the thing I was seeing to all of the, the the business and the people would tend to be involved in it because people would send to say oh you idiot you effer you stupid person you're a moron and i'm going that's not really clarifying a heck of a lot and so i what i had it my image in mind is somebody that has a protective mental shell that's absolutely impervious to evidence and you can lob right. data at them until the cows come home it just bounces right off and the image that i had in mind was a turtle and the idea that somebody pulls a little head into the turtle shell and they're just seeing a, a, ter a narrow tunnel vision view of the world to where they're literally not thinking about stuff. Uh, and the, I, I came up with this concept that I dubbed Matthew Harrison Brady syndrome uh, for the character from Inherit the Wind that was based, of course, on William Jennings Bryan, where at the Scopes yeah. trial, he said that I don't think about things I don't think about. Yeah. I realized that's what I was literally seeing in all of these various people, including very bright people like Philip Johnson. So I thought, okay, I wanted to call them turtle minds, but I didn't want to insult turtles. So I, I looked around and I found that the word tortucan, tortuca, Latin for turtle, really hadn't been used much. I thought, okay, I could use that as a noun and an adjective of where I, that's describing somebody whose cognitive architecture is dominated by this ability not to think about things they don't want to think about. And it can take on a variety of different modalities. They can have lots of little Tortucan ruts that are disconnected. They could have shallow ruts, deep ruts. There's a lot of different dynamics that could go on. It relates to cognitive dissonance. It relates to confirmation bias. There's a, a whole laundry list of psychological terms that connect up with this. But I thought, okay, it's a single word. If I describe somebody as a Tortugan, whether they're bright or stupid, I'm not saying whether they're right or wrong. I'm not saying whether they are liberal or conservative, whether they're religious or atheist. None of that applies. I'm only saying that they have an ability to not to think about things they don't want to think about and that this is dominating their thought constructs. Yeah. And once you realize you ever, that, yeah, jump in. Have you ever, have you ever, come, across, have you ever come across Morton's Demon? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, that's about thermodynamics, isn't it? No, no, no. Relationship. That's, no, that's Maxwell's demon. Maxwell's demon. Okay, Morton's demon. Okay, fill me in on that one. That one so, I'm not aware of. So th there's a there's a, a, a famous creationist. Actually, I'll will dig out the thing and put it in the oh, in Glenn the, Morton in the comments. Glenn Morton. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And he's a former creationist, um, and. He came up with this idea, and actually, it was very, very related to Maxwell's demon, except that where Maxwell's demon was, where, where Maxwell's demon dealt with um, filtering out certain thermodynamic concepts. Uh, I'm, I'm not expressing myself very well. Martin's demon was a little demon that sat on your shoulder, and any evidence that countered your specific worldview was was immediately battered away, and anything that, that supported it was allowed in. It was very much like Maxwell's demon, but it was purely about... Yeah. Um, it, it's interesting about uh, Morton, because he is a fascinating one from a source methods point of view, because although he has given up young earth creationism, he hasn't he's still a become a Tortukan free thinker because he's actually a climate change denialist. Yes. How he approaches that data set, he's got the same traits uh, that you find that the source methods approach is like a universal tool stick here that can help delineate yes. things. And uh, theoretically, follow me on these points. You should be able to ask me for my documentation. You should be able to ask me how I checked out stuff. And those of us, those of you who have seen me in action, know that I'm 
perfectly happy to do that. <laughs> and so hopefully I'm scoring pretty low on the don't think about things I don't want to think about index. Uh, and hopefully I've not made too many uh, mistakes along the way. Yeah, yeah. Slid and past. that's the thing. Because a really rational person wants to be, wants to face it perfectly. A really rational person wants to believe as, as, as many true things and as few false things as possible. Myself, the, the term belief has no meaning. It's useless without utility. Well, I don't have a problem with the terminology. I make a point well, that I, we can use whatever terminology we like, but we always want to be clear if there's disputes on that. And you've probably seen this in some of the stuff at Steve McRae's things where, they, where you have atheists and agnostics going at each other tooth and tongue like a Calvinist and a Lutheran. Uh, and I go, oh, let's get, get over it. Just set out what you believe and, and your definitions and use what it is and then figure out how to uh, uh, flip back and forth on it. Uh, so I'm never one. Some people object, for example, to the use of evolutionist or Darwinist as a term. And we know that anti-evolutionists like to pick on those sorts of things. And I have no problem with it. I, I'll call myself an evolutionist. And uh, um, uh, what I want to do is to drag them away from the rhetoric and move to the data stream. And uh, one of the tests that I constantly do online, and anybody that follows me on Twitter should be able to, to observe this and verify it for themselves is that if I ask them a source methods question, how it shuts them down. They can handle insult like mad. You can, you can insult them as a moron, and, and you can have people ping-ponging back and forth on that for the kill the cows come comb. But when I will ask them, okay, what sources did you use, and how did you fact check them, it, you hear crickets. Or I get blocked in a hurry. And it's their... It's yeah, their blocking is going to be a big one. That's anyway, usually listen. an indication of it, yeah. And it's because th they, they're suddenly getting into a zone where, ironically, they can't bear false witness. I've never once encountered an anti-evolutionist who has ever made up a source out of thin air. And while I read a Schmidlap's book, and there is no Schmidlap book, I've never encountered that happening. What they won't oh, claim... I have. Then you're looking at the wrong spot. I've seen people or, do that. Hmm? I have as well. I've I've encountered that a lot. <laughs> oh well, I, you you you've into a different game than I have because I've I've never seen anybody um, offer an imaginary source, uh, an imaginary RJ? personage, or anything like that. RJ, then you haven't spent a lot of time dealing with flat Earth or, yep. or geocentric heads. Um, I've actually flat run into Earth a couple of creatures that have gotten used to it. Uh, a flat Earther will actually cite an imaginary source. I mean, somebody they just yeah. made up out of thin air. A creationist. Oh world. yeah, that's no. the best. Uh, you also get various other world blue peddlers, especially well, those that are big into the into the quote unquote supernatural. They will do this. The citation source, well, the author's well, own ass. Be an example in the creationist venue. I'd be kind of curious. Is can you recall a case of where a creationist has offered a, a, an imaginary source that they have defended as though they had read it? Off um, the top of my head, no. But I I can provide one. Uh, however, listen. Um, I have to go because I've just been, I've just, uh, Mrs. Slosh has just walked down the stairs uh, and it's um, early hours of the morning. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, we're and past our hour anyway. Uh, and we got off onto some delightful tangents, but yeah. the uh -huh. um, glad, glad for showing up on here and I'll probably be shutting down here in a moment uh, yeah. on that. So, so I, uh, the, the take home that I want everybody to do, that scholarship is a contact sport that you have the tools available on a scale you've never had before, that nobody has the excuse in this day and age not to have the best data available, and that if you force everybody to play on that data field, uh, Tortukans can't play there, and people who believe in woo can't play there, and it's really going to show. Agreed. Off, turning tail, running, blocking doing all sorts of stuff. It won't mean they won't still be a nuisance. It won't mean that they won't still be voting for nincompoops. It won't mean that they won't be involved in all sorts of stuff. But the more you start shining the light on it, the more it causes them to divert where the cockroaches have to run to the corners because the light's on. And that distracts them then from being quite as much of a nuisance as they were before. We need to test it out to see if that approach will work. Indeed. Um, anyway, good morning, Joel. There are two videos I want you to have a look at. 
one of them is on my channel. The other one, the other one was made by Martyrer eighty one. Oh, can you put uh, a, a list up there? <coughs> what um, of the the links? And I'll have to check that later. I will about be shutting down the video um, now because we are at six seventeen, and I will turn into a pumpkin shortly. Apocalocentosis, just in case you needed to know. And uh, uh, thank okay. you all for uh, watching this episode. I hope uh, that uh, it was entertaining and informative. Uh, as usual, I remind people, I have a GoFundMe and Patreon sites and books that you can do. And even if you can't because your budget is pushed and stressed, uh, you can tell people about it. You can email. You can go on social networks. If you've read my books, you can go on Goodreads or other places that you have. Any venues you can do and tell people about it because um, uh, that is also part of the thing. Well, thank you very much. And we are now concluding Evolution Hour 20. Uh, source Methods 101.